All right, there you go. We got it rolling for you here today. Mississippi Outdoors Radio is always brought to you by the Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. As a matter of fact, uh, they just uh, they got the youth uh, the youth special uh, the the youth super hunt just super done. Super hunt just yep. was just done this past weekend. Just this past weekend, which is uh, what the foundation sponsors one of the many things they do: archery mm-hmm. in schools, many things that they do. Uh, outdoors radio, outdoors TV. The foundation does that. Uh, so we can talk about these wonderful things that are happening. And uh, we got a great show today. Dr. Steve Damaris, the pres- professor at the MSU Deer Lab, is here with us. We're going to be talking with him. Adam Butler is always to my left. Major Chris Reed to my right. As uh, we are here today and we're ready to get this underway. We're going to be talking about the science deer movement. But first, let's talk about some things we got to get going. Uh, Eagle Lake's back in action, correct? Yeah, back in effect. It's, Finally. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time coming. And we in February? right yeah february yeah it's oh, wow. that's a long long time and uh the commission and executive uh staff did their due diligence and did some site visits listened to the public throughout the whole process and so there were people on both sides of it that wanted it open that wanted it continue to be closed due to property and whatever the case may be and so it was open last week um back for for use um fishing right in time for duck season and so um that's good news because it means that the properties over there aren't necessarily in any danger of further damage and then um you know they've been keeping it at a very low pool for people to have an opportunity to repair some of their their decks and their and their structures uh, along their properties there so it's open good to go well that's a good thing um that is a good thing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. That uh, obviously there was a lot of problems, a lot of issues that were there. That was a mess. Uh, oh yeah, it was, and that was one of the things they were using. That the county was using the boat ramp parking lot as a debris drop off, and so people were were just basically having to gut their homes and all that. It was just a bad deal, and they were using that for. And so we were, you know, working with the county there. Uh, the EOC over there to to utilize that area, which made life a lot easier when you're trying to get rid of debris rather than having to take it yourself and all that good stuff. So uh, it's back open. It's always, you know, you never want to see that type thing happen. And so um, you just got to deal with it the best we can. And I think we did the best we could as an agency entertaining both sides of that. All right. Also, uh, the WMA mobile check-in app. Uh, that's something that you really need to be aware of, right? Right. Um, we've been plugging it, JT. So um, if you hunt on um, MDWFP wildlife management areas, um, you know, this year we've, we've got a, a, a mobile check-in app. So we had a lot of success with the, the Game Check app back in the spring. Um, technically, it worked really well. Uh, so this year you're you, you, you basically have two choices. We're, we're wanting most people to choose the WMA check-in app. Uh, if, you, if you insist on staying old school, we will have one uh, check-in station per WMA available with the cards and everything. But we really hope um, users will embrace this new technology and start transitioning because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make things a lot more convenient for them. They don't have to go out of their way. Uh, you can do everything on your phone. You can do it on your phone before you leave your house if you wanted to uh, and it makes it more convenient on us to gather that data we don't have to have someone instantly. running all of those yeah. we get the yeah that's right. right we get the information back instantly so um, win win for both sides so we're encouraging folks to to use that um, <clears throat> another thing JT uh, waterfowl draw hunts are open and so you know we do our waterfowl hunts a little differently than we do um, some of the other species so it's basically a two week rolling period for, for duck draws so we're we're I guess two weeks out now or a little more than two weeks out from the opening of duck season so we're yeah. taking applications for draws for that first couple of week period in the in the waterfowl season and then there'll be another period open and so on so if you're interested in hunting um ducks or waterfowl on our wmas or on some of those um waterfowl specific wmas during the early part of the season you better go check that out uh, to be sure you can try to get a spot and then you know don't want to dwell on it jt but we're still encouraging folks if you if you harvest a deer particularly if you're in one of our cwd zones to bring that to one of our uh drop-off locations we got those all around the state uh you don't have to you're not required to but we would 
strongly encourage you to because we we want to get those samples so that we can monitor this disease and we really want to rely on hunters to do that we don't want to have to go out and do any sampling directly ourselves well and it's it's in your best interest too if you're going to uh if you're going to consume the meat it would be in your best interest to make sure that deer is uh, cwd free and what uh, would it take a couple of weeks usually two three weeks month we, maybe <clears throat> no less than that we tell people about two weeks and, yeah. and in most cases we can have information back to them quicker than that but you know some of the big peak periods opening week around christmas that kind of thing mm-hmm. uh, may take two weeks to get those results back to jay you. from the res has one for you major reed if it's raining acorns at your house and you gather up a bucket full and spread them at your deer stand is that considered baiting well if there's not a oak tree around your deer stand then you're going to have some splaining to do well i don't I've I've heard of people doing that before, and um, that's one of those that there's really not a law that deals specifically with transplanting acorns, I guess. And yeah, that's one of those. As long he's not talking about yellow acorns, is I don't he? think the yellow acorns, the <laughs> yellow acorn. No, he Seems was talking like that'd be a lot of trouble though. Got to go out. Well, maybe they're wanting to transplant some acorn trees to their deer stand. They might have some oak trees finally come up. It would be kind of hard to explain that there's acorns everywhere and there's no oak trees around your deer stand. That would be. It would be, but if you're in a hardwood forest, it would be hard to prove in a core. This is true. There's another thing I want to mention, T. Um, We're still getting calls in from those CWD management zones about feeding. Right. So you can't do it. It's uh, no feeding in those zones. Be mindful of that when you're going out. Literally, we we answer calls every day asking about what are the new feeding regulations and um, people from in those zones. And so, just make make known that you can't do that in the CWD zones. Those zones are listed on our website. That does not include food plots. You can plant a food plot right for deer in those zones. That is accepted. And another thing, we kind of want to um, toot our horn. Uh, Cole Edwards, one of our officers in Northwest mississippi along the mississippi river and uh, my old area of of influence bolivar county is where he's assigned he won they had the uh conference for the southeastern fish and wildlife agencies how many how many states is it 14 Fit, no 14, 16 15 15 states represented yeah of all the southeastern states and he won the overall officer of the year uh for the southeastern united states so that's a praise for Officer Edwards up in northwest Mississippi. Someone says, does the game warden have to have probable cause to come onto someone's property? Yeah, so if there are game species that could be living or have been known to be living there, basically anywhere in the state of Mississippi fits that criterion, that's a probable cause that we have to go on properties and check for hunting and fishing Mm -hmm. uh, compliance. Is there a direct number to report night hunters? 1-800-BE-SMART. That's it. Yeah. And if you have a disability license, do you have to purchase a WMA permit, Scotty from Florence? No, you're exempt. If you're exempt from purchasing a license, you're exempt from mm-hmm. purchasing a permit. Is it too late to plant a food plot in North Mississippi? Well, you're getting on the edge, but you, you, you it depends, I guess, edge. on when. You, yeah, I mean, you could probably stick one in and see what happens. Hurry up and get it in because yeah. it, it may not be too many more warm days ahead. Right. Hopefully. Oh, uh, don't 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 count Jinx. it out. I've had shorts on on Thanksgiving. Okay, it's yeah, uh, but now, isn't Christmas. Yeah, it could be anything. So don't ever think that the warm days aren't there. All right, uh, we've got a lot to do here today. It's Dr. Steve Damaris is here with us. It's a pleasure to have you back. Happy to be here, JT. Uh, we're going to talk about this now. I know you told us forever and ever y'all don't shoot those deer with them collars on them, and, <laughs> but now we want you to shoot those deer with them collars on them. That's right. We've got most of our deer back. Right. The collars came off the deer mm-hmm. like they're supposed to, mm-hmm. but we have uh, about a dozen deer that the collars malfunction. They did not drop off like they were programmed to do. Mm-hmm. And so, if you see a, a collared deer, not an ear tag deer, but mm-hmm. a, a collared buck big orange collar on their neck can't miss it it's pretty obvious right (laughs) Uh, we'd be happy for you to shoot that deer and give us back the collar and give us there's a phone number on it give us a call and listen if you're and if you're conservationist you want that information to be back to these guys because the things that we're going to learn from this we're going to talk about that the science of deer movement as dr steve damaris is here with us he's the professor at the msu deer lab and uh, we'll do that when we return with Mississippi Outdoors Radio. Dr. Steve Damaris here with Professor at MSU Deer Lab, along with Major Chris Reed, Adam Butler, Mississippi Outdoors Radio. And uh, we're ready to go. 
Now, uh, we were talking about the collars. People have heard and read about the Buck Movement Project you guys uh, had in Madison and uh, Yazoo counties. And uh, we're talking about uh, the the background behind this and, and, and why y'all did this. Well, the agency, Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, is always dealing with hunters' concern that they're not seeing deer. And so that was the basis for the project, JT, uh, specifically how, to, how does hunting affect uh, visibility and movements of adult bucks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, hunters want to see deer. And if they're not seeing them, they're going to let the agency know about it. Sure. Y'all have screwed it up. It's all y'all's fault. I'm yeah. sure that's what they'll hear. And your average deer biologist says, well, it's about weather. It's about uh, habitat conditions. It's about the acorn crop. But we needed data. The agency needed data. And Mississippi State uh, Deer Lab is uh, who they came to to help them out. Mm-hmm. I think part of that, too, is that the technology's changed so much over the last 10 years where with the GPS collars like you guys were using, I mean, you can collect l- literally hundreds of thousands of locations, and that would have been almost impossible not that long ago. That's right. We, we have uh, data currently from 68 adult bucks, uh, one year or the other or both years. And that's a huge data set, over three-quarters of a million locations of the deer wow. in Madison, Yazoo County. So we're going to learn a whole lot. We're just now uh, cracking the egg and, and putting it in the pan and see what we learn. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, we, we learned about how hunting uh, – uh, that what the, the main reason was this to see how pressure on these deer made them move. That was really what we were trying to – you were trying to learn, right? That's right. How do hunters and their you know, their presence on the landscape affect deer movements? And then secondarily – acorn crop and and food supplies and food uh, food plots how do those things interact with hunter activity and and then we also have the big the rut time the rut season so you get those three factors taking place across the hunting season and we did our best to uh figure it all out we uh madison and rankin uh, rather i'm sorry madison and yazoo counties around the big black why why there well, we needed adult bucks, and we needed a large number of adult bucks, and there are not a lot of places in the state that have a good population of adult bucks over a large acreage with landowners willing to allow us to come in and collar their bucks. And, and we had about 70 different landowners cooperating in those two counties, over 66,000 acres involved in the study, and, and you just can't go anywhere many places in Mississippi to have that kind of cooperation. So we really appreciate those landowners. And of course, uh, it, we, you had the you had the buck population you needed. You had the acreage there, and the things that are going on now. Doctor Damaris, I know we talked about the fact that we uh, didn't uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, collars did not come off. I understand they had like a little charge they were supposed to pop and then yes. fall off, and uh, they did not do that. But that data is still on those collars, the right? Data are still there, so we need to get those collars back. Yeah, how long would that data stay there? Do you think it'll stay on there? If, forever okay uh we just need to get the collars back as soon as possible right and you can't obviously track these deer anymore so you don't know where they are if you would you'd go get the collars right there's a few that are still sending us uh a location estimate at once a week yeah to uh we we dropped the location estimates down to once per week just to preserve the battery a little bit longer but most of them are non non non-functioning anymore okay so or but do you know they're still in the area though right yes we have about uh well, 10 that we know are still in the area for sure. Okay, okay. I mean, there's a chance you may not get them all back. Uh, that, that Y'all knew that going in, though, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We, we picked up one yesterday from the, a landowner that uh, they had found just walking into a stand. It had fallen off the deer somehow uh, during the summer, and it was just lying there on the ground. And it had, the battery had died, so it was no longer transmitting to us its location, but it has two years of data on it. So mm. we're really excited to get those kind of uh, callers back. Real quick on the ceasefire text line, Greg, there is no feeding in CWD zones. I don't care if you spread it, if you sling it, if it's in a manger, you cannot feed in a CWD zone, period, mm-hmm. period. Uh, there is no argument. So, uh, And even if you're feeding to watch deer out in the backyard and you're in a CWD zone, you're going to get a ticket. So that's uh, that's the only way I can tell you this. Um, but, no, you cannot have feeders whatsoever if you're out there. <clears throat> John wanted to know how you, got the, how you got the collars on the deer. Obviously, y'all tranquilized them. 
Yes, basically like bow hunting. Mm-hmm. You, you uh, need to be within 20 or 30 yards of a, of a deer to, to effectively dart it. You shoot a dart out of a gun. Uh, we use night vision scopes. Most people realize that uh, deer move more at night. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so we, we hunted through the night with night vision scopes, and uh, we had special permits to do that. It's not a recommended hunting uh, opportunity, uh, but we were able to do that with the research collection permit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, uh, well, that was our next question. Uh, you had some you had some really good folks that did that, right? Yes. We had two great graduate students, Ashley Jones and, and Colby Henderson. Ashley came from Wisconsin, and, and Colby's a Mississippi boy, so – and, and we had great cooperation from the agency staff. They were out there middle of the night working with us, fighting off mosquitoes and cold weather in the, in the wintertime. So, so we're still hunting uh, 12 collars. That's correct. 12 collars. 12 collars that was for, was for promote the harvest of collared bucks. Uh, and, of course, this is out there, folks. And, and what we want you to know is what they're trying to learn is the movement of these deer. And if you see these deer with these collars, take them out. Uh, take them out. They need these collars back. And, uh, of course, it's going to be on a nice deer, too. I don't think you're going to be hesitant to do that. They're all adult bucks. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't think you're going to be hesitant to do that. It's going to be a nice buck if you can uh, if you can get to it there. And uh, that would be something very important. All right, I know you're early in the whole data analysis process, but tell us what you've learned so far. Well, we've really been excited personally uh, about a, a personality difference in bucks we've looked at some movement patterns and during the hunting season bucks tend to have different types of movement personalities some of them are sedentary they you know couch potatoes they they sit around in a single home range make short what we call excursions outside the home range for a day or two and come back and you know it's about a third and then another third are what we're calling mobile bucks and they are the, the hyperactive types, they actually live in two different home ranges, and they, they move back and forth between those two home ranges at different times in the year. And, and uh, so it's literally two home ranges separated by miles. And so that's really exciting. We've never documented that. And then another third are kind of in between. they they mostly a sedentary home range, but they do a lot of excursions. So the, these kind of movements that haven't been documented previously, JT, this is such a huge project with so many deer, and, and we're learning so much, and, and we're going to be uh, learning more over the next year or two. We're just touching on the, the tip of the iceberg with this show today. So I, I got a question, Doc. I, I know <clears throat> you read some stuff that suggests that, that bucks, as they age, or they get their, their home range shrinks a little bit. So these thirds you're talking about, was there a difference by age with those? Was that were, were those different personalities related to how old they were, or just totally random? You think they it, just... it was pretty random. Mm-hmm. We have not found any age-related effect on those personalities. So you, you're mobile. You're mobile from the get-go. And, and JT, if I can put a plug in for our Facebook page and Twitter and Instagram and and the YouTube channel for the MSU Deer Lab, we're putting out little. Uh, videos and, and bits of information that on an almost weekly basis this hunting season about our results so check out those msu deer lab youtube channel and, and facebook and uh that was where you could get it now i understand y'all had 67 bucks collared is that correct 67 uh actually a 68th we just picked up the 68th one uh yesterday and uh it's a huge database and you know one of the things we we learned was about that buck personality and we've also looked at buck behavioral states it's called where they have a a certain behavior and uh one of the behaviors we looked at is bedding one is feeding and the third one is just walking and we've shown that during the months of october and november uh, bucks spend about 55 percent of their time bedded 35 percent of their time feeding and 10 percent of their time walking around and that walking would be between bedding areas and feeding areas so that's consistent across October and November. Now, I think I'm going to be coming back in December, and we're going to talk about some really exciting changes in those behavioral states during the rut. Uh, so listen back on December 9th. I think I'll be back here, and we'll talk about that difference. But October and November, 55, 35, 10. Now, looking at the time of day, though, it's a, re- it's a different story. Daytime. Just hang, hang, hang right there. 
we're going to talk about these movement patterns and talking about what you're talking about with the time. Sure. And then we'll get into pr- hunting pressure and more and how that affects as well. We are here with you, uh, Mississippi Outdoors Radio. Dr. Steve Damaris is here with us with the MSU Deer Lab. All right, Dr. Steve Damaris, let's get into it. Well, we're talking about um, movement patterns in October and November and uh, uh, about how how far these guys roam around. Yeah, and one of the things I want to emphasize is hunters complain about they don't see bucks during the day. Well, we showed that during the nighttime, Bucks spend 20% of their time walking around and only 40% of their time bedded. During the daytime, they spend only 10% of their time walking and 60% of their time bedded down. So hunters don't see deer during the daytime because they're bedded and they're not moving around. So that just makes real good sense. Mm -hmm. Something we all pretty much knew if you've been out in the woods. We see does, but you don't see bucks unless it's around rut time. That's right. But this, this is data that the agency can use to say, this is why you're not seeing deer during the daytime. Mm-hmm. And another really cool thing we looked at was home range size and daily home range. Because when a hunter is out hunting, they're concerned about seeing deer where they are today. Mm-hmm. And so we looked at daily home range size. And within a day across the hunting season, a buck is going to spend, uh, well, during October and November, they're going to cover about 140 acres. Oh, wow. Which is a pretty good amount of area in a day. Right. 140 acres. And uh, during that day, they're going to have something we call path length. If you connect the dots for all their movements, the, their total walking distance during the day is about 1,500 yards, which is a lot of area to try to hunt, cover 140 acres with a buck moving around 1,500 yards. Now, the really cool part about this is their net displacement, which is the difference between where they started and where they ended up at the end of the day, at the end of the 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's almost 1,000 yards away. So the idea that a buck is starting out from his bedding area and going around and doing his thing and coming back to the same location at the end of the day, totally wrong. Really? Mm. 1,000 yards away is, is where they end up 24 hours later. Now, Some of our earlier work from last year, we showed that bucks have these focal areas. So they move to multiple areas. So they have multiple bedding areas that they focus on. And so these focal areas are, you know, five or six different locations that a buck will use. And so where he starts out one day isn't where he's going to end up at the end of that day. He'll be in another focal area. So in general, is that what they're doing? They're kind of from day to day moving between those focal areas? Yes. Within a day, they move between focal areas, and then, uh, but they won't be back to the same one at the end of that that day. May come back to it the next day, but not necessarily that day. That's right. Right. That's right. So, you know, don't give up a spot where you've seen a deer, but don't expect him to be back there the same time of the day. All right. What about hunting pressure? How did that affect movement? Well, we looked at the, the... the effect of hunting pressure on those daily home ranges and we thought maybe the size or the shape would change in response to hunting pressure and we were really surprised that only seven percent of daily home ranges of bucks had any hunting pressure in them at all the shape didn't change the size didn't change i think what's happening here are the the bucks have already got those hunters figured out they're not going where they're hunting they're staying wow. away from them Wow. That's what I was going to ask. Was it, did that mean that the deer were basically avoiding where people were going? And, and, and is that, well, wait a minute now, Doc. There could be, it could be the people just aren't good at figuring out where the deer are. <laughs> yes. Huh? Yes. I, I've, I but over 66,000 acres, you'd have figured they'd have had some good hunters in there if you're calling those people not the best. I'm not saying I'm the best either. It's just, the data speaks for itself, it sounds like. It, it's pretty conclusive in that way. And then tied together with that is we looked at habitat selection, mm-hmm. where they go to, what kind of habitats they use. For bedding or? For for anything. Okay. And uh, relative to hunting pressure, really low pressure, moderate pressure, and high hunting mm-hmm. pressure days. And we showed that when there's heavy hunting pressure during October and November, bucks actually avoid those heavily hunted areas Mm. so back that ties back to the daily home range not Mm -hmm. associated with risk well when (coughs) the risk gets heavy when there's more hunters on the landscape they don't go where the hunters are 
So it's a mm. clear learning process where bucks yeah, so learn. That would suggest it's not necessarily that the hunters aren't as good at finding the deer. It's that the deer are responding. The deer are figuring it out. So the deer are smarter than the hunters is basically what the study has I found. I won't say that, but <laughs> they do a good job of avoiding where the hunters are. They're trying to survive. Well, I mean, come on, let's be honest with each other. Even the does, I believe, understand when the hunters are out there. They 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 change their 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 antics. You can see that on trail camera action. You Absolutely. Know? I mean, that's that's not hard to know. They know, I, they know what that when that four wheeler cranks up. I believe that. And well, and, if we if we flip the whole script, and somebody was actively trying to take your life each day during a certain amount of of months. You try to avoid those yeah. people as much as you could. And so I think we were duck hunting one time last year, and they were like, I just don't understand why they aren't coming to the decoys. And I said, well, I mean, they've been shot at for a few months now, and I think we underestimate the value of – if you, we were in that same situation, we'd be trying to duck and dodge all we could. All right, did bucks alter their use of habitat or areas in response to hunting? Yeah, we looked at uh, – bedding areas versus areas within the home range that weren't used at all by a buck and this is these are areas within a given buck's home range where did he spend his most time hanging out likely bedded versus uh, the habitat conditions where he never used within but but within his home range so it was available to him he just chose not to go there at all and we looked at the vegetative structure the the vegetation and the screening cover and the bedding areas had 50 percent more screening cover mm -hmm. than the unused areas so if you want to find where bucks are during the day and bedded find where you have the worst visibility on your property and that's probably where they're going to be Hunters love to be out in these big open mm -hmm. bottom, uh, bottom line hardwoods and they're they beautiful. can see 100 yards yeah, and it's so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, we, we're putting up a Facebook post, uh, our video this coming Thursday. We'll be showing a used area and an unused area in a bottom line hardwoods and it's very striking. Mm -hmm. Check it out. Wow. This Thursday, you said? This Thursday. Okay. All right. And uh, so uh, you also have where we're talking about habitat selection analysis identified risk related switching points all right unpack that for me now well yeah that's kind of what i already <laughs> mentioned a few minutes ago i jumped around and from my outline here jt uh, at low and moderate hunting pressures they tend to use habitats the same but when you get to that heavier hunting pressure days they switch they there's a tipping point where they avoid what they normally would go to say that and and uh, uh. so basically what we've learned is that the deer really like the thickets the bucks like the thickets they want to hide uh they're trying to do everything they can do to hide from you where you can't see them and uh it that's why it is so hard to kill a buck uh, a lot of people don't realize that mm -hmm. they're they're few and far between but they're they're not going to step out in that food plot and just munch like a doe's going to do every afternoon are they that's right and you know, you have to just be aggressive in, in how you hunt. You can't just drive your truck up to your normal food plot that's had a hunting stand in it for 20 years and just climb into that stand and think you're going to see see adult bucks. You have to be more aggressive. You have to go out and find where yeah. they're bedded, find where they're going to eat, and then get up in a climbing tree stand yeah. or on the ground stand in between those places and catch them when they're walking. Was there any data um, in that small, minimal amount of daytime movement activity that you mentioned in October, November, that was a certain time period, mornings <coughs> versus evenings? You know, you hear, you know, on, on outdoor television now, like there's not any good, really good hunting activity early season versus December or whenever the rut kicks in. That's a great lead-in uh, to, major to the to the next show. Yeah, we're well, going to get we're here some for. really exciting. All right. Where is the data and information publicly available? Uh, MSUDeerLab.com? Well, uh, we don't have everything on the MSUDeerLab.com webpage yet, but uh, the Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channel, MSU Deer Lab. Uh, one last question. Does feeding increase bedding time percentage, increase nocturnal activity? We're, we're, that's, a, that's a nut. We're still cracking. All right. We'll, we'll give you more on that when you come back in uh, December. Last question, Greg in Oxford. What's the penalty for feeding corn? Heard possibly a federal charge. No, there's no federal not a federal charge. charge, but the rumors out there are rampant. They just they get better every every day. But it is going to get you a ticket. Yeah, so one to five hundred dollar fine plus court costs. Yeah. So, 
folks, uh, plant your food plot. Get find an to, acre and tree. Get the way. A, hunt a trail. the way. Hunt the way our grandfathers and fathers yeah. hunted. I mean, I just... It's not difficult to everybody. It's, it's really how, not. How we can't harvest a deer now without feed when we've made it Did for, it for thousands years. of years. Dr. Go Steve the, Damaris, thank you for being here with us. Appreciate it very much. And we'll talk about Mississippi Outdoors TV when we return. And Mississippi Outdoors, also brought to you by the Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, just like Mississippi Outdoors Radio, Mississippi Outdoors TV. What's happening, Adam? Tell me about the uh, segment that's coming up. Uh, we're going to have a pretty cool episode this week. Uh, I think it will be a real treat for viewers. It's going to be kind of a, a walk down memory lane with Melvin Tingle. If you listeners will remember, we, we mentioned uh, about the passing of Mr. Melvin here just a few weeks ago. And so uh, this Thursday night, uh, the episode will be uh, kind of a, a, a look back on 30 years of Mississippi Outdoors television. Um, just little clips from episodes all throughout that. 30 years that'd be pretty cool yeah gonna have some cool stuff uh jerry clower archie manning others i i the guys at the office showed me a little bit of uh some of jerry clower on there from i think the first season and it was just (laughs) really good i mean yeah i I was i was sitting there thinking i wish we could have just had him on you know all the time well well, i expect they were coon hunting with uh (laughs) What were them uh, carbide lights? Yeah, what well, actually, they were <laughs> most of the. Cl- I don't know if the clips that I saw are going to make it into this highlight reel, but they were mostly just sort of sitting around the fire, <laughs> and that was the funny part. You know, they just mm-hmm. kind of talking as you would think Jerry Clower would be doing, but it was he had some good ones. Uh, so that'll be on, um, and then uh, kind of a, a side note. That's going to be the bulk of the ep- of the of the uh, episode this Thursday. Uh, as a side note, uh, from here on out through January. Uh, we'll not be showing any new episodes due to uh, MPB Pledge Drive, so it'll be after the first of the year before we get back to, to new episodes. Um, so that'll be when the, the rest of the season continues. But um, check it out. So kind of a walk down memory lane with, with Mr. Melvin and well, 30 years of the didn't television Didn't we find show. out um, earlier in the show that they did a, um, a, a show, <clears throat> Mississippi Outdoors show, with Dr. Damaris um, on this deer study, right? That's right. That's right. We aired a uh, um, last season. I think the 2018 uh, season of Mississippi Outdoors had an episode on the deer study that that Dr. Demaris has been talking about uh, the past hour. So, so our uh, man Chip's gonna yeah, Chip's gonna link it on the comment section of the live stream. So if you're if you're on the on the Facebook, go check that out. If not, you can dig through YouTube or something and find it. But yeah, I, I remember watching that one, and I remember. I remember being really impressed. It was a very well done episode. Covered mm-hmm. everything. And now we started a few bucks. We're mm-hmm. starting to unpackage the, yeah. the some of the night vision stuff. Yeah, yeah. If you want to see what it would be actually like to hunt deer at night, you can watch that show. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not you may even be interviewed on there. I can't. Even, I, I can't I, remember. I may have. <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll have that linked up. So go check that out. Uh, if not, uh, Mississippi Outdoors television airs thursday nights at 7 30 on mpb and then it re-airs on saturday nights at 5 30 and then we always have uh rerun shows posted on website and uh, facebook and youtube so check it out now you're going to come back in december and we're going to talk about the rut right yes sir yeah we're going to still we'll, i know i don't want you to give anything away but we <laughs> We're probably going to see a little difference. Yeah, when you start talking about testosterone and opportunities to breed, things change. As we all know. That's why we're in the woods all day long during the rut, because things change. That'll be great. Do we know when he's coming back in December? I think we did we set it. The December, the 9th, 9th, December 9th, I think, yeah. uh, maybe was okay. mentioned. A little over a month from now. Just in time for everybody yeah, that's right. the ninth. to yep. use their newly found knowledge to go put it yeah. to work in the woods. Which will be depending on where you're at in the state. You'll either be just the rut just getting underway, or you just you're, you're starting. It's pretty to see. much is perfect. Yeah, you're you're getting to it. Yeah. you're right there. Yeah. Varies a little bit. Yes, you know, I, I think it's just where you're sitting as to where the rut is. Believe it or not, I know we say it comes over, you know, comes down from right. the northwest and moves its way down, but we've seen. I I think it backs up and goes forward and does whatever it wants to do. I, I really <laughs> do. It's I don't know if there's any real logic on it because I've heard of people. Say, man, I've seen duck, you know, bucks running does, and it's not even supposed to be rut time in that area. Right. So, I think when love's in the air, it's just when it when it happens. Yeah, it's not can. necessarily when it's going to happen. Like All right, Reed, one more time. I, I've still got people. I don't under how clear to make this with these CWD management zones. You cannot 
put feed out in the CWD management zones. Whether you, you can't throw it out anyway, even if you, you if you're never, not in a sudden yeah, in one of those zones, you could never put it on the ground right. by hand. If you're in approved feeders, spin cast, the feeding trough, the manger as you referred to it, I, I enjoyed that. Um, it's not at all zero. I don't know if we got time. Why is there no early primitive web in the South District? Do we know early primitive? At that uh, answer, well, that's a reduced bag limit down there. So yeah, that, that's in response that, to lower deer density. That so primitive that early primitive weapon does. season was to allow additional antlerless harvest. Okay. And that area of the state doesn't need that. Sorry, I didn't get to that one yeah. earlier, but we got it in there. Dr. Demarius, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, JT. Thank you for, great uh, to be here. Thank you for all that valuable information. I appreciate it. MSUDeerLab.com. You can even see pictures of the deer they got up there. It's a really cool website. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back in December. All right, uh, Butler, appreciate you being here, yes, Reed. Stay safe. Till next week. We'll see you next Monday more Mississippi Outdoors Radio right here, Super Talk, Mississippi. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. <laughs> 